Hi, welcome to The Little Cast. My name is Melanie Thorley and uh, I'm the director here. Now I'm going to go through actually a number of things today. We're going to start with some relatively um, new pieces of legislation and some information. Now we're, we're moving into the first of July, um, past the 1st of July. We've got a new financial year here in Australia and we've got a bunch of new laws that have just been put in place uh, or protections that have been put in place by our Labor government uh, starting basically around about now. So here in Australia we have compulsory payment into what we call superannuation or in some countries it's called the pension. That amount is in addition to somebody's salary. So if your minimum wage is uh, $25 per hour, then you are entitled to receive an amount of money, percentage of that, above and beyond. So at the moment, uh, before July 1st, it was 10.5%. So if you were entitled to $25 per hour, you'd be entitled to 10.5% of that to be deposited into a nominated superannuation account. Uh, now it's just jumped to 11%. So employers here in Australia uh, should be aware that uh, they need to start paying 11% in super. Now, for those who are earning above award salaries, that can be ingested into your overall wages or overall salary. Uh, but you just got to make sure that your minimum wage is X and then the super is on top of that. And that's now. We've got a new change as well. Um, we've been talking about this for some time to, uh, they say to create um, greater flexibility for employers to take unpaid parental leave. Um, now, from the 1st of July, employees taking unpaid parental leave will be eligible up to 100 days of their 12-month leave entitlement. Employees taking unpaid parental leave will be able to take up to 100 days of their 12-month leave entitlement flexibly during the 24-month period after the birth or placement of the child. Um, so this used to be a 30 day entitlement, but now it looks like it's 100 days. Um, pregnant employees will be able to exercise their flexible unpaid leave up to six weeks before the expected date of the child, um, birth of the child. And employees will no longer be prevented from taking more than eight weeks of unpaid parental leave as part of their spouse or de facto partner program. Now, this is all really actually very complicated. So what it's really saying is if you're eligible to take parental leave, um, that eligibility is, is you're allowed to take unpaid leave up to one year after your baby is born. But there is this kind of space where you can take leave that used to be no more than 30 days up to two years after your baby was born or you receive your child um, for adoptions. But now they've extended that to 100 days. So not only are you eligible to take that 12 months, but you're allowed to flexibly use 100 days of that 12 months somewhere else. And there's this thing where um, you can use them in conjunction with your partner's eligible um, eligibility as well. Now, I find this really interesting because I actually don't know how this is going to work in small business. Um, if you've got an eligible employee in a small business and that business says has three employees and that employee wants to take up to a year off and then wants to be wants to take six months off and then wants to take another hundred days off say somewhere else um, that's going to apply a lot of pressure on that small business it is all unpaid leave but small business for those of you who don't know it takes a while to train somebody into that job it takes about three months to get them really comfy and if they are taking say six months off then you're really only getting the benefit of the person who's in that role if you can find a placement for that role uh, for really only three months and you're it's just a really interesting situation on how that's going to work in practicality but 
this is the new laws. These are coming in. Um, paid parental leave is also going up. I think we've talked about that before. Um, it used to be some obscure week, like 18 weeks, and I think now it's 20. Uh, but that's not paid through your employer. It's paid through some government um, payment scheme. The next one that's coming in to effect in December 2023 is that employees that are able to make deductions that are recurring or vary from time to time, there used to be this really uh, specific rule about that. Deductions needed to be in writing, agreed by both your employer and employee, and I, I mean a deduction out of their salary. And that deduction um, need to be for the benefit of that employee, so they might be deducting know, for a salary sacrificing a car, for instance. But in certain situations, and I can't really think of anything specific right now, but there might be a one-off payment that they really wanted to deduct from, and or that that amount that they want to deduct changes from time to time, and. Until now, or until the 30th of December, employees and employees are going to need to have an agreement in writing for each single time that they need to deduct if the deduction changes. Um, now, in this case, an employee can make a single written authorization that allows their employer to deduct from the amounts of their salary that may vary from year to year um, with only one. Um, authorization instead of like numerous ones. Look, I can see how that might work. There's this reduction in paperwork and hopefully it'll make it a little bit easier. I just suspect actually that no one's going to understand how to do it. <laughs> it's just so obscure. Let's <laughs> see how it works out in, um, in practicality. The next one I want to talk about is protections for migrant workers. So this takes effect now. In fact, it's, it's, it's taken effect from the 1st of July 2023. Now, in Australia, migrant workers have always had the same rights and entitlements as any other worker in Australia, Australian workers, if you, if you will. Um, all workers in Australia have the same entitlements. Migrant workers continue to have those rights regardless of their migration status now and a breach of the act doesn't affect the validity of the employment contract or a contract for services. Um, and this includes circumstances where migrant workers have breached the condition of their visa or doesn't, go, or doesn't have work rights or doesn't have the right to work in Australia. Now, this is a fascinating one because it's a real problem, I guess, in many, many countries, and it's a problem here in Australia, where you have a worker on a visa, and often those visas uh, have restrictions on how long um, that worker can work each week, or how many hours they can work in a fortnight, uh, and then those restrictions change over school holidays if they're at university. Uh, there's loads and loads and loads of different things that happen. Um, there's lots of restrictions about how the minimum amount of money you may pay a migrant worker uh, and stuff like that. So that's all sort of sitting in the sort of migration law, which I actually don't know anything about. Um, and until now, we've had these workers being treated quite unfairly in certain circumstances where they are incredibly underpaid uh, because there is a breach of that condition and now the employer has this kind of hanging over them this like guillotine type thing hanging over them saying oh well you've breached that condition if you don't continue and um, not complain i won't make a representation to the immigration department and you won't lose your visa status or something. Also, there's this concept where if you've signed a contract saying that you are going to be doing this job and you're not eligible, is that contract void? Because, you know, it was a, there's a breach of contract there. So in this case, I'd like to see how it's going to work in actual reality. But you can see how having more protections under the Australian 
um, industrial relations regime for workers who are getting dealt with inappropriately uh, could be protected there. And I actually think that's a nice thing. The next one I want to talk about is, in my view, batshit crazy. Actually, just batshit crazy. I'm, <laughs> I can see where they're going with it, but it's just batshit crazy. Um, this is about the black coal mining industry. And yes, let's set aside everybody who is of the view that mining companies make a kajillion dollars, so this shouldn't be a problem. I'm, I'm talking about the broader issue. So this change is taking place on the 1st of January. And it means that employees in the black coal mining industry are going to get access to what we call portable long service leave. Uh, entitlements as they go between employee, employers. So the changes are to clarify the amount paid out as part of an employee's long service leave entitlement must include casual loading. I can see how that makes sense. And the method of accrual for long service leave for employees is going to change as well. Now there's some, this kind of really interesting because this seems very onerous. So the things that have changed is a casual employee's casual loading will be applied um, to whatever levy payments by the employer in the coal mining industry and that employee is going to be receiving um, that entitlement. So there's this thing about casual workers um, only receiving their non-casual loading amount for long service leave. Now, <coughs> Excuse me. Long service leave here in Australia is regulated by each state or territory. Here in Queensland, you are eligible for long service leave after 10 years of service and then after 15 years of service. And then at once you hit 15, it just accrues long service leave. Um, the entitlement after 10 years is 8.66666 weeks and you receive a and you know, and that portion kind of rolls over. Now, here in Queensland, you can be entitled to long service leave if you've been employed for more than seven years, but less than 10, and your employment is terminated by your employer's doing, but not through issues of misconduct. So essentially redundancy. Yeah, it's a good one. So in this case, it means, and this is really about casual workers, um, in this case, an employee in the black coal industry accumulates long service leave entitlements as they're working. Now, in one way, we go, yeah, look, that, that makes, and this, this is also happens for redundancy payments uh, in the um, construction industry. So, what, what's going to happen is that employee might be with someone for a year and a half and they accumulate long service leave. And then as they go, they receive, um, you know, they accumulate that long service leave payment and then get it paid out. So what it means in practicality is no matter how long you're with an employee, you're still going to receive long service leave. But in any other regular environment, that empl an employee wouldn't receive long service leave unless they're there for at least seven years under very circum um, special circumstances, but actually 10 years. So the, so the individuals in the coal industry are actually getting a benefit which most other employees are not going to receive. And this also goes for um, the construction industry with this portable redundancy. So if an employee leaves, say they resign, uh, under the current labour regime, um, the employment law regime, that construction worker is entitled to a redundancy payment even if they resign after six months, seven months. So it's not about redundancy, it's not about their job no longer being required, it's about them leaving. And they will receive their redundancy payouts every time they leave an employee. I don't like it. 
I don't like it one little bit. And I also don't like this levy that um, this this levy system that the government is now going to be putting in place in order for employers to pay into, because any system needs needs managing, and that system needs managing. And who's going to pay for that? It'll be the businesses adding to that levy, so the so they're not paying just only the small portion with which that employee is entitled to. Uh, they'll be paying a bit more to keep the 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 scheme running and i really fundamentally disagree with that for a start there is an entitlement there that has occurred where no other employee would be entitled to employees aren't entitled to redundancy payments usually if their jobs aren't redundant that seems pretty simple and they certainly wouldn't be entitled to redundancy payment if the job wasn't redundant and they resigned. So I really don't understand why all of a sudden construction workers and mine workers get these extra benefits that nobody else would be normally entitled to, which I think is very, let's just say budget crazy. I also don't agree that these additional payments ought to be borne by the employer because for some reason they just happen to be in the wrong industry. But the trouble is, if they're not going to be paying it, who the hell is? We've got these systems in place. Do we want everybody else to be paying this? I just, I just, my mind is blown. So that's that one. The other thing I wanted to mention is we now have some more certainty around general protection applications. So those of you who have been watching this podcast from back and beyond will know that every now and again we talk about cases in relation to general protections. General protections is a space in the Fair Work Act where an employee is, should be able to exercise a workplace right or make a complaint or inquiry and they are adversely treated because of it. Now in our regime we have non-dismissal dispute applications and dismissal dispute applications and if an a, in, if a dismissal dispute application is made the Fair Work Commission needs to satisfy itself that all reasonable attempts have been made to resolve the matter before handing it to the Federal Circuit Court for instance. Now there has been for years, quite literally years now, um, a serious question that, need, that has been asked about what if there's a jurisdiction objection? So what if the employer says that the employee wasn't terminated and the employee and employer are forced to go to court to have that question heard? Well, now we've got some better decisions saying it should stay at the Fair Work Commission. The Fair Work Commission should hear whether or not somebody was terminated before progressing and giving a certificate of foul conciliation. And there's also this other new case that's come out that's basically said that ought to be done before a conciliation has been set down. I'm wondering how that's going to work in practical sense. Are we expecting employers to fork out additional monies because it costs about five to ten grand plus to run a jurisdictional objection in the Fair Work Commission? Um, are we expecting employers to pay out these sort of this sort of monies in order to defend a claim they believe is to be very genuine that they didn't terminate this person? Um, and are we? Are we saying that it's okay for employers, employees to use this as, as a form of further getting back at the employer because they know they have to go through the super expensive process? And on the flip side, are we saying that an employee who genuinely feels like they were terminated um, because they were forced to resign, um, has no other option but to go through an expensive and lengthy um, jurisdictional question before they can even conciliate. I guess there's no right answer here, but those of you who have been watching this in the past will understand that 
I am of the view that this system is getting more and more complicated. When I say this system, I mean the IR system here in Australia is just incredibly complicated. There are so many laws and so many rules and so many things that we have to think about. It's a wonder anyone's getting it right. Um, and if you don't get it right, there's no space to say, oh, well, I tried. I genuinely tried. No. That's, that's, not, that's not okay here. Apparently, um, even getting something wrong innocently when you're doing your best to try and get it all right is still punishable, has still penalties attached, and is still a problem. And you can still be, you have your whole pro problem laid out on, um, in a document for everybody else to read. Anyway, on that note, we're in a brand new financial year. I am super excited. I love all this new technology that has been um, that has been growing in the background. I am getting um, lots and lots of um, um, uh, training in some of this really new technology that uh, we can use out there. I am really excited to find out how this all plays out. I know that people are upset that robots are taking their jobs. <laughs> I get that. I understand people don't want robots taking over their jobs. But I am honestly of the view that we as human beings need to innovate, we need to do better, and those jobs that robots are doing gives time for people who um, are doing jobs that robots can do to do things that are actually far more interesting, that are far more um, exciting. And I really like that concept. In my business, I've taken a lot of the tools and things that I used to employ human beings to do, and I've given that basically to programs that do things automatically. And I've given those team members other things to do. I really love it. I really like it. And I just want to say one thing. I'm just going to get on a little bit of a, a different tangent. Here in, here in Australia, universities are really struggling with um, programs like ChatGPT. ChatGPT is writing essays now and handing in assignments and so on and so forth. You know what? I think us as a community need to do better. We need to innovate. We need to stop um, assessing our students on their assignments and start being more innovative with how we do assessments. If ChatGPT is going to take over and everyone's going to get assignments written by it, then stop assessing students on their assignment ability. Start looking at other ways to assess knowledge. Because that's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about how to assess how much knowledge someone has um, to achieve a goal that they are learning about. That's what we're talking about here. We need new, innovative ways to do that. And I think that we should be out there not complaining about this thing that's happening, which is not going away. Uh, I think we should be um, thinking about how we can keep moving forward. There's this problem that parents are talking about at the moment, about our children and are failing to learn critical thinking. Uh, I disagree. Let's give them new things to think about. If if we're expecting our young people to learn by writing an assignment and that's how they critical think and we don't need them to do that anymore, then what do we need them to do? What is the critical thinking we want our children to learn and how do we teach it? That's what I think. Anyway, it's a little bit of a soapbox, people. Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, MJAT is really embracing new technology at the moment. I'm getting really excited about what's out there and I'm looking to the future to see what is actually on the horizon because I think this is all bloody brilliant. Have a great day. Thank you for watching the Lawcast and I'll catch you again in a couple of weeks and next week, next time we are going to start, I'm going to bounce back to my HR program and we're going to start looking at some videos and TV shows that are doing uh, HR wrong or HR in that could be doing better in HR. <laughs> Thank you everybody for watching. See you later.